Sakazuki, or Akainu the Big Red Dog, is the Fleet Admiral of the Marines and the head of Marine HQ. To the untrained eye, you might think that his biggest rival in this story is Kuzan, codenamed Aokiji, since they have the connection in their past to the Ohara incident, which we'll get back to in a bit, or the fact that they fought each other for the right to become the next Fleet Admiral. But no, in the shadows, Akainu's true rival has been lurking this entire story, Monkey D. Dragon, before they were Marines. In SPS 65, Oda draws several prominent marines as children, including Sakazuki, who looks like he comes from poverty. Not a lot else is known about Akainu's past and upbringing, but I'm sure wherever he grew up was likely ravaged by pirates, and that instilled a deep hatred of them in him. Dragon's childhood is still mostly a mystery as well. Dragon is so secretive that even the people that he's close with in the Revolutionary Army don't know details about his past. Details like where he's from, or the fact that he had a son. But during the ASL flashback, when Sabo runs into his arms after the nobles went to burn down Great Terminal, Dragon remarks that the Kingdom of Goa has done this to this boy. And so I think that he also grew up in Goa Kingdom, and his initial sense of justice was burned into him on this island as well, similar to Sabo. Marine Cadets it was recently revealed in the Egghead Island arc that Dragon was once a marine. He and Akainu are both 55 years old, with Kizaru being a year older. So it's likely that they all started off as cadets together, while Aokiji was a bit younger than everyone else, so he likely came later. Not sure at what point Dragon decided that the marines were not it, and that he was going to fight for justice in his own way. But Garp, Sengoku, and Suru joined the Marines in their early 20s, and we don't see Dragon again until his early 30s, where he had already been out of the Marines for a while. He could have been a Marine for years, and even moved up the ranks somewhat in the time that he was there. But this is definitely where these two first met, and I think that there will be a connected, defining moment from this time that causes Dragon to leave the Marines, and Sakazuki to strongly disagree with him on what's necessary to maintain justice. The Ohara Incident the Ohara incident is a defining point in time for both of these characters. Approximately 22 years ago, the island of Scholars, Ohara, would be bombed to hell with a buster call after the Scholars attempted to decipher the Poneglyphs. This is a great sin in the One Piece world, and so Cypherpol agents were sent to the island to investigate, and when Professor Clover stood on the biggest business and said he knew about the ancient kingdom of the Void Century, the Gorosei knew he had learned too much, and the Scholars were killed. Sakazuki actually was there as a young 33 year old vice admiral. He gave the order to sink a civilian boat that was escaping the island just in case a scholar snuck onto that boat. This is the earliest we've seen him so it'll be interesting to see if he was always like this. As for Dragon, also 33, he had long left the marines at this point as when he goes to see the aftermath of Ohara, it's revealed that he actually knew Professor Clover and the scholars. He was also surprised to hear that Vegapunk had joined up with the corrupt world government. He also had a group called the Freedom Fighters, which Vegapunk had turned down joining because they were broke. Broke ass. In Kuma's flashback, we actually see that 25 years ago the Freedom Fighters were already active, three years prior to the Ohara incident. So it's established that Dragon had long-standing relationships outside of the Marines at this point. Later that same year of visiting Ohara, he would go on to start the Revolutionary Army with Ivankov and Kuma, rising in notoriety. We see in Kuma's flashback that over the next few years the Revolutionary Army would grow in scope and eventually Dragon would be known as the world's worst criminal, as the head of that army. This army had the goal of toppling the celestial dragons at the top of the world government. He has been so steadfast on this goal that he's put it ahead of himself and even the people that he's close with, as it's not like he gathered the troops to go rescue Connie or Kuma when they were captured in Marijua. Sakazuki, on the other hand, continued through the marines and became an admiral with the codename Aka Inu, or Red Dog. The admirals have to be ready to be deployed if a celestial dragon is ever messed with, so it's almost like they're directly at the behest of the celestial dragons. This is a big reason why Garp never took the promotion to admiral, even though he clearly was powerful enough to do so. At Marineford, we really see how much dragon is still on Akainu's mind, because he only refers to Luffy as Dragon Son. It's clear that whatever their history is, it left a serious mark. We also get to see the true brutality of Akainu's absolute justice, as he's ready to kill any marine that wants to run away from battle or that gets in his way, and isn't above trickery and taunting his opponent for the greater good. 
post time skip, and beyond. During the time skip, Sakazuki rises to the rank of Fleet Admiral of the Marines and is now more in the war room than he is out in the battlefield. However, this job has been far from easy for him. He's had to deal with the rise and fall of Yonkos and Warlords and several rebellions caused by, you guessed it, the Revolutionary Army. This has spread the Marines' resources very thin. It's clear that he doesn't love having to answer to the Gorosei and deal with the politics of the position. When he talks to Kuma, he probably can relate to calling Kuma nothing more than a mere puppet. And when he questioned the Gorosei on why a pirate like Doflamingo should be able to get special privileges, like faking resigning from the Warlords, he's ultimately told to sit his ass down and is reminded that the Marines are just the face of the world government. And this here is what I think Dragon first had an issue with. His mindset was likely similar to Garp's, but just to the extreme. Dragon realized that even if he made it to the highest position in the Marines, even then he wouldn't be able to have the freedom to have justice for all that he truly wants. True justice. Doflamingo once said during the Marine Ford War that ultimately whoever wins that war will become the true justice of the world. Sakazuki believes that maintaining the balance of power, by any means, is the right way to go about things, but I don't know how much he knows about what evil truly lies behind the face. We've already seen inklings that Fujitora and Kizaru may not side with the Celestial Dragons when push comes to shove, and Kuzan is out to prove that the world government isn't the only way to accomplish your goals. So it'll be interesting to see who Akainu believes is truly the greater evil in the end. Dragon believes in all to have equal freedom of justice and that it will never be that way unless the Celestial Dragons relinquish their power. In his younger years, he believed anyone working with the royal government is likely an enemy, as shown in his conversation with Dr. Vegapunk. But over time, it appears that he grew out of that mindset. When he speaks about the current rebellions to Ivankov and Sabo in Egghead, he says that in the eyes of the rebellious, anyone affiliated with the royal government is the enemy which sounds very much like the young, early 30s dragon. Then he speaks about how there are good rulers out there, like King Cobra of Alabasta, which I think shows that he believed in his own sort of absolute justice at one point, but has since grown past that. At this current time, his sights are set directly at the head of the snake on the Celestial Dragons. Will these ideals come to a head and clash on their way to their ultimate goals? I think so, because while Dragon did say that the Holy Knights will be the ones that they'll have to look out for, and Akainu would prefer to leave the troubles of Marijua for the Holy Knights to deal with, but if there's a war coming, which honestly has already started, with the Revs declaring war and cutting off the Celestial Dragon's food supply, we'll have to see whose justice is really true.